chapter 29. For a moment, no one moved. Even the terrified Stenman had gone limp against the cellar wall, his dark face staring blankly at the silent form that waited statue-like at the top of the ancient stairway. The lined face of the prince was drained of colour, and the eyes reflected a curious mixture of anger and confusion. Resolutely, Minion Lee met those searching eyes, his sword arm lowering slowly, his own hatred fading with the sudden turn of events. Their lives might all be forfeited if he didn't act fast. Roughly, he yanked them into his feet and threw him disdainfully toward the prince. Here is your traitor, Palance, the real enemy of Callahorn. This is the man who gave Shill Ravenlock to the Northlanders. This is the man who would give Tursus to the Warlock Lord. My lord, you've come just in time. The mystic had recovered his wits enough to cut Minion off before any more damage could be done. He stumbled fearfully to his feet and rushed up the stairs, throwing himself at Palance's feet and pointing down at the company of friends. I discovered them escaping. I was running to warn you. The Highlander, he's a friend of Balinor. He came to kill you. The words were tumbling out of the man's mouth in undisguised hatred as he groped at his benefactor's tunic and raised himself slowly to his side. They would have killed me, and then you, my lord. Can't you see what is happening? Minion fought down the urge to rush up the steps and cut the evil mystic's lying tongue out, forcing himself to remain outwardly calm. His gaze riveted on that of the stunned Palance Bacana. You have been betrayed by this man, Palance, he continued evenly. He has poisoned your heart and your mind. He has sapped you of your will to think for yourself. He cares nothing for you. He cares nothing for this land, which he has so cheaply sold to the enemy that has already destroyed Kern. Stenman roared in fury, but Minion continued in stony disregard. You once said we would be friends, and friends must have trust for each other. Do not be deceived now, or your kingdom will surely be lost. At the bottom of the stairway, Bellinor and his friends watched silently, afraid that any distraction might break the strange spell Minion Lee was weaving. For Palance was still listening, his clouded mind struggling to break the wall of confusion surrounding it. Slowly, he stepped forward on the landing, closing the door quietly behind him and brushing past Stenman as if he hadn't seen him. His advisor hesitated in confusion, glancing unto uncertainly at the cellar door, as if debating the wisdom of attempting to flee. But he was not yet prepared to accept defeat, and he whirled quickly, catching Palance by the arm and thrusting his lean face next to the man's ear. Are you mad? Are you as insane as some say, my king? He whispered venomously. Will you throw everything away now? Give it all back to your brother? Was he meant to be king? Or you? This is all a lie. The Prince of Lee is a friend to Alanorn. Palance turned toward him slightly, his eyes widening. Yes, Alanorn. Stenman knew he had struck a nerve and was determined to pursue it. Who do you think seized your betrothed from her home in Kern? This man who speaks of friendship was part of the kidnapping. It was all a ruse to get inside the palace and then assassinate you. You were to be killed. Below the stairway, Hendel took a step forward, but Balinor put out a restraining hand. Minion stood quietly knowing that any sudden move now would only confirm Stenman's charges. 
He directed a withering glance at the wily mystic, turning quickly back to Palance and shaking his head. He is a traitor. He belongs to the Warlock Lord. Palance took several steps down the stairway, glancing briefly at Minion and then staring fixedly at his brother, who waited patiently at the foot of the stairs. A faint smile crossed his lips as he paused confusedly. What do you think, brother? Am I really mad? If not me, then why it must be everyone else? And I alone am sane. Say something, Balinor. We should have that talk now before... I did not want to say something, but the sentence was left unfinished as he straightened his tall frame and looked back once again at Stenman, who had taken on the appearance of a dangerously cornered animal, crouched and waiting to attack. You are pathetic, Stenman. Stand up! The sharp command cut through the stillness and the bent figure of the mystic snapped upright. <sighs> Advise me what I should do, Palance ordered sharply. Do I have everyone killed? Will that protect me? In an instant, Stenman was back at his side, the sharp eyes cold with fury. Call your guard, my lord. Dispose of these assassins now! Suddenly, Palance seemed to waver, his tall frame drooping, his eyes glancing at the walls of the cellar and studied concentration of the stonework. Minion sensed that the Prince of Callahorn was again losing his grip on reality and falling back into the clouded world of madness that had impaired his once sound reason. Stenman recognised it as well, a grim smile creeping over his dark face his hand coming up to stroke the small pointed beard. Then abruptly, Palance spoke once more. No. There will be no soldiers, no killing. A king must be a man of judgment. Balinor is my brother, though he wishes to be king in my place. And I must talk now is not to be harmed, not harmed. His voice trailed off and he smiled unexpectedly at Minion. You brought Shul back to me. I thought I had lost her, you know. Why, why would you do that if you were an enemy? Stenman screamed in fury, grasping furiously at the other's tunic. But the prince did not seem to realise he was even there. It is difficult for me to think clearly, Balinor. Palance continued in a low whisper, shaking his head slowly. Nothing is clear anymore. I don't even feel angry toward you for wanting to be king. I have always wanted to be king. I have, you know. But I have to have friends, someone to talk to. He turned dispassionately towards Stenman, his eyes blank and expressionless. Something his advisor saw there caused the mystic to release his grip on the other's arm and shrimp limply back against the stone wall, his jaw sagging in fear. Only Minion was close enough to realise what had happened. Whatever hold the evil mystic had managed to secure over Palance back Hannah was gone. The man's already muddled thought. Processes had been pushed beyond the brink of even basic comprehension of identities. And Stenman was now no more than another face in a sea of indistinguishable beings that haunted the nightmare world of the maddened Prince of Gallahorn. Palance, listen to me, Minion called softly to him, 
reaching through the web of darkness to the man beneath for just an instant. The broad figure turned slightly. Call Sheil down from her room. Call Sheil and she will help you. The prince hesitated for a moment as if trying to remember. Then a smile crossed his haggard face and a deep calm seemed to settle through his whole body. He remembered her soft voice, her gentle manner, her fragile beauty. Memories that recalled peace and serenity. Memories of deep affection that he had never found with any other human being. If he could just be with her for a while. Sure, he spoke her name softly and turned back to the closed cellar door. One hand outstretched. As he brushed past Stenman, the crouched mystic seemed suddenly to go berserk, shrieking with rage and frustration, he threw himself at the other man, grappling wildly at his tunic front, responding instantly, minionly, bounded quickly toward the high landing to part the struggling men. But he was still several steps away when Stenman's lean hand drew back momentarily. Holding high a long dagger seized from beneath his robes, the weapon raised and for one terrible second hung poised above the men. As Valinor cried out in helpless shock, then it fell. The lance back Hanna rose sharply to his full height, the dagger buried to the hilt in his broad chest, the terrible whiteness flooding his young face. I give you back, your brother, fool! shrieked the maddened Stenman, shoving the rigid form down the stone stairway. The stricken prince fell heavily into Minion's outstretched arms, knocking him back roughly against the wall, causing him momentarily to lose his balance and the opportunity to reach the hated enemy. Stenman had already turned to flee, pulling frantically on the massive cellar door. Balinor bounded up the stairway, Desperately trying to stop the mystic's escape, the elven brothers immediately behind him, yelling for the guards. The scarlet figure had pulled the door partially open and was just slipping to freedom when Hendel, still standing at the foot of the stairs, seized the discarded mace and hurled it wildly at the fleeing man. Struck the, mess, the mystic's exposed shoulder with bone-crunching force, and a scream of pain echoed off the dank walls. Yet it wasn't enough to stop him completely, and for a moment later, he had disappeared through this doorway. From the hallway behind, they could hear a shrill cry that the prisoners had assassinated the king. Balinor paused only an instant in his pursuit to glance down on the still form, resting quietly in the strong arms of Minion Lee, then raced for the open cellar door. Two black-clad guards appeared suddenly from the hallway beyond. Swords drawn to confront the unarmed bordermen. They could have been statues for all the difference their unexpected appearance made to Balinor, who bowled them over with a lightning assault, seizing a fallen sword as he disappeared from the view. Jiren and Dayel were only steps behind. Minion knelt alone on the stairway, gazing after them and holding the stricken palance cradling gently the body of the self-proclaimed King of Callahorn. Silently, Handel climbed the stone steps to stand beside him. Shaking his grizzled head sadly, the prince was still alive, the shallow breathing harsh in the eyelids twitching periodically. Grimly, the dwarf reached down as Minion held the limp form and slowly withdrew the deadly blade, casting the weapon aside with disgust. The dwarf bent to help the Highlander raise the wounded man, and abruptly the eyes opened for an instant. Pallant spoke softly, a barely perceptible murmur, and then drifted into unconsciousness once more. He's calling for Shirl, Minion whispered, tears in his eyes as he glanced briefly at the other. He still loves her. He really still loves her. In the hallway beyond, Balinor and the Elven brothers were struggling to catch the fleeing Stenman. Everything was in a state of utter confusion as guards, household servants, 
and visitors milled through the panic-stricken palace. Shouts of terror echoed off the ancient walls, decrying the death of the king and the warning of assassins bent on killing everyone. The sounds of still another battle rose from the palace gates to aid to the growing chaos. Balinor and his two companions fought their way through the knots of frightened people who seemed to go into a state of complete hysteria at the sight of drawn weapons. A few scattered guards even attempted to bar their passage, but each time the giant Borderman merely flung the unfortunate men aside without pausing and raced in pursuit of the red cloaked figure stumbling ahead. Stanman was still in sight when the three pursuers reached the central hallway but he had broken through the hindering throng and was beginning to draw away. With unbelievable fury, Balinor pushed ahead, heedlessly knocking everyone in his path aside, his face grim and terrible. Then suddenly, the palace doors shuddered under the weight of dozens of battling men and burst open with a crash directly in front of the Borderman and his elven friends. The confusion was complete as a huge knot of fighting men rushed wildly into the entryway in the halls, be halls beyond, shouting for Balinor and waving their drawn weapons with grand flourishes. For a moment, the prince was uncertain who they were. Then he saw that they were wearing the leopard insignia of the Border Legion. A few palace guards who remained either fled or threw down their weapons and were seized. The Legion soldiers immediately spotted Balinor and rushed over to him, grasping him and raising him to their shoulders with chairs of victory. Durin and Dayal were cut off from him. The cheery mass of men barred their pursuit of the rapidly disappearing Stenman. Balinor shouted and struggled furiously, desperately trying to break away, but the sheer weight of numbers prevented him from resisting the tide that suddenly surged forward, carrying him back toward the cellar. The frustrated elves finally broke through the mass of bodies, racing after their quarry who had turned down a different hallway and was momentarily lost from sight. The lean elves were very fast, however, and closed the gap between themselves and Stemman in a matter of seconds. Rounding the corner of the hallway, they caught sight of him once again, the dark face flushed with terror, the right arm hanging limp and useless. Silently, Jiren cursed himself for having failed to pick up a longbow, Abruptly, the fleeing man halted and vainly tried to wrest open one of the several doors lining the left side of the passage. The latch held despite the mystic's repeated efforts to force it, and at last he turned once more and raced to open the next door down the hall. Jiren and Dale were only yards away as Stemman succeeded in opening this one and disappeared inside, closing it with a resounding crash. The elves were in there in seconds, finding the door secured from within. They proceeded to force the iron latch with their swords. The clasp was sturdy, and it took them several endless minutes to break through. By the time they pried open the door and burst into the room, with swords held ready, it was deserted. Minion Lee stood quietly at the front gates of the Bacana home as Balinor conversed in low tones with the commanders of the Border Legion. Shell was next to him, one slim arm locked in his, a young face lined with worry in the noon sunlight. Minion glanced down at her momentarily and smiled reassuringly, holding her closer to him. Beyond the great outer wall of the city of Tursus, two divisions of the reassembled Border Legion waited patiently for the command that would take them into battle against the awesome Northland army. The huge invasion force had reached the northern banks of the swollen Mervidan River and even now was beginning to make its crossing. If the legion could hold the southern bank even for a few days, it might give the Elven armies a chance to mobilise and march to their aid. Time Minion thought bitterly, all they needed was just a little more time, and so far, they hadn't got it. The Border Legion had been reassembled as quickly as possible once the city was secured, and Balinor was reinstated as commander, but by that time, the advancing Northlanders had already reached the Myrmidon 
and began preparations for the crossing. Balanor was now king of Calahon, though it was anything but a cause for celebration. His brother lay in a coma, weakened and extremely close to death. The best physicians in Tursus had examined him with laboured patience in an effort to determine the cause of his irrational behaviour and after some time had concluded that he had been given a powerful drug over a long period of time to break down his resistance and reduce him for all practical purposes to a mindless puppet. Finally, the dosage had been increased to the point where his mind and body had been pushed beyond the point of physical and mental endurance. In the end, his madness was real. Balanoi had listened to their conclusions without comment. Now earlier, he had found his father in a deserted room in the north tower of the Bakana home. The aged king had been dead for several days, and a physician's report revealed that he had been systematically poisoned. Stenman had kept everyone from that room except himself and the already unbalanced Palance. So the secret of Rule Bakana's death had been easily kept. Had the mystic succeeded in having Balanor kill, it would have been a simple matter to persuade Palance to open the gates to the armies of the Warlock Lord, and in so doing, assure the destruction of Tursus. He had nearly succeeded once and he might still do so. Stanman managed to elude the Elven brothers and was hidden somewhere within the city. In a very real sense, the future of the Southland rested in the hands of the Prince of Calahorn. The people of Tursus looked to the Bakana family for dependable government and strong leadership. The Border Legion functioned best as a fighting unit when Balinor was in command. Now the giant Borderman was the last of his family and the man to whom everyone turned for leadership, whether openly or subconsciously. If anything were to happen to him, the Legion would lose its finest commander in the heart of its fighting strength, while the city would lose the last Bakana. The few who fully understood the gravity of the situation realised that Tursus must be held against the advancing Northland army or the Southland would be lost and a wedge driven between the armies of the Elves and the Dwarves. Elanon had warned them if this should happen, the Warlock Lord had won. Tursus was the key to success or failure and Balinor was the key to Tursus. Yana Simpre had carried out his part in securing the city earlier that morning. After Minion left him at the gates, he sought out the Legion commanders, Vanwick and Gennison. Secretly, they reassembled key members of the disbanded Legion and, striking quickly and quietly, seized the gates and the army barracks. Moving rapidly toward the palace, they gained strength, almost without opposition, until finally the entire city surrounding the Bacana family home and gardens was resecured. Waiting just outside the palace grounds for a signal from Minion, the three commanders and their followers heard the cries within of, assass within of assassination. Fearing the worst, they rushed the gates, forcing their way inside just in time to prevent Balinor from catching the fleeing Stenman. There was almost no loss of life in the brief uprising, and the followers of Palance were either in prison or free to rejoin their old units in the Legion. Already two of the five Legion divisions were reassembled, and the other three would be formed up and properly armed by sunset. But scouts from the city have reported to Balinor the progress of the Northlanders in reaching the Myrmidon, and concluded that he must act immediately to prevent the crossing. Handel and the Elven brothers lounged restlessly off to the right on the steps of the palace, their faces reflecting mixed emotions. The dwarf appeared as resolute as ever, his aging countenance implacable, as he glanced casually over at the Highlander and his beautiful charge. Duran seemed somehow older, his lean elven features, clouded by the knowledge of what lay ahead, while Dayel 
though shadowed by the same uncertainty, managed a cheerful smile. Minion shifted his gaze back to Balinor and the Legion commanders. Jennison was heavy set with shocking red hair and powerful arms. Van, Van Wick was aged and grizzled with a dripping white moustache and a scowl to match. Acton was a man of medium height and regular appearance, whose horsemanship was said to be matchless. Messaleen was tall and broad-shouldered, almost arrogant looking as he rocked carelessly back on his heels while Balinor smoked to them. And last came Yana Sempre, recently promoted to full commander in recognition of his courageous stand at Kern and his vital role in the recapture of Tursus. Minion studied them carefully for long minutes as if somehow his visual appraisal could ascertain their worth. Then Balinor turned and walked over to him, motioning for Handel and the Alps to join them. I'm leaving at once for the Myrmidon. He informed them quietly when they were all together. Minion started to speak, but Balinor quickly cut him off. No, Minion. I know what you are going to ask, and the answer is no. You will all remain here in the city. I will trust any one of you with my life, and since my life is of secondary importance in comparison with Tursus, I ask you to guard the city instead. If anything should happen to me, you will know best how to continue the battle. Janus remains with you in command of the city defences, and I have instructed her, him to confer with you on all matters. Even time will come, Dayal spoke quickly, trying hard to sound cheerful. Balinor smiled and nodded in agreement. Alanon has never failed. He won't fail us now. Uh, don't expose yourself unnecessarily, Hendel warned grimly. The city and its people depend on you. They need you alive. Goodbye, old friend. Balinor gripped the dwarf's hand tightly. I depend on you most of all. Your experience is twice mine, and you are twice the strategist. Take care. He turned quickly motioning for his commanders, and entered this waiting carriage that would convey them to the city gates. Yana Sempre waved reassuringly to Minion as the palace coach drew away. The mounted escort fell falling into shape formation to the rear, and the gallant procession galloped with a clashing of iron-shod hooves toward the Sandic Bridge. The four companions in Shul Ravenlock watched until they were lost from sight and the thunder of the hoods had drifted into silence. Then Handel muttered absently about checking the palace once more for some sign of m the missing Stenman, and without waiting for a response, re-entered the back hunter home. Juran and Dale trailed after him, feeling strangely disconsolate. It was the first time they had been separated from Balinor for more than several hours since the long journey from Calhaven had begun many weeks earlier. And it was disquieting experience to allow him to go on alone to the Myrmidon. Minion knew exactly how they felt, his own restless nature inwardly urging him to go after the Borderman, to join him in the crucial battle against the hordes of the Warlock Lord. But he was nearly exhausted. He had not slept for almost two days. The strain of the battle above the island of Kern, the long flight down the Myrmidon, and the rapid series of events which had led to the freeing of Balinor and the others had sapped even his great stamina. Almost drunkenly, he stared Sheil into the gardens at the side of the palace, dropping heavily onto a wide stone bench. De Gil sat quietly next to him, watching his face as he closed his eyes and forced his mind to relax. I know what you must be thinking, Minion. His soft voice drifted gently through his weariness. You want to be with him? The Highlander smiled and nodded slowly, his thoughts hazy and jumbled. You must get some sleep, you know. Again he nodded and suddenly he thought of Shay. Where was Shay? 
We had the Valmen wandered in his futile search for the elusive sword of Shannara. Quickly he raised himself, snapping awake and turning to Shul, almost as if he thought she might not be there. He was exhausted, but he wanted to talk. He needed to talk, because there might never be another chance. In low, sombre tones, he began to speak to her, telling her about himself and Shay, unfolding in bits and pieces the friendship that had so closely bound them in the years they had known one another. He spoke of the times they had spent in the highlands of Lee, drifting gradually into the full story behind the journey to Paranal and the search for the sword. At times he rambled in vain attempts to explore in the depth the rationale behind feelings they had shared and philosophies they could not. As the Highlander continued, Shell began to realise there was not really Shay that Minion was trying to describe. It was himself. Finally she stopped him, reaching without thinking to place a slim hand over his lips. He was the only person you ever really got to know, wasn't he? She asked quietly. He was like a brother. You feel responsible for what happened to him. Minion shrugged disconcertly. I couldn't have done anything. But what I did, keeping him in Lee in the first place, would have only prolonged the inevitable. But knowing all that doesn't help, I still feel sort of guilt. If he feels as deeply for you as you do for him, then he knows in his heart the truth of what you have done. Wherever he is now, she responded quickly. No man can fault you for the courage you have shown these past five days. And I love you, Minion Lee. Minion stared at her stupidly, the sudden declaration catching him off balance. Laughing at his confusion, the slim girl wrapped her arms around him, the reddish locks falling like a soft veil about his face as she clung to him. Minion held her close for a moment, then gripped her shoulders gently and pushed her back to study her face and eyes. She met his gaze squarely. I wanted to say it out loud. I wanted you to hear it, Minion. If we are going to die, she choked suddenly on the words and looked away, and the wandering Southlander saw tears slowly roll down her cheeks. He reached up and quickly brushed them away, smiling in the old way as he raised himself to his feet, drawing her up with him. I came a long, long way, he murmured gently. I could have been dead a hundred times, but I survived. I've seen the evil there is in this world and in worlds that mortals only dream exist. There is nothing that can hurt us. Love supplies a kind of strength that can withstand even death. But you need a little faith. Just believe, sure. Believe in us. She smiled in spite of herself. And I believe you, Minion Lee. Now you remember to believe in yourself. The weary Highlander smiled back at her, gripping her hands tightly. She was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. And he loved her as much as his own life. He leaned down and kissed her warmly. It will be all right, he assured her quietly. It will all work out. They remained a few minutes longer in the solitude of the gardens, talking quietly and absently following the little paths that wound through the warm, fragrant summer flowers. The minion was fighting to remain awake, and she was quick to demand that he get some sleep while he had the opportunity. Still smiling to himself, he retired to his bedchamber in the palace, where he collapsed, still fully clothed, onto one of the soft, wide beds and immediate fell, immediately fell into a deep, dreamless slumber. While he slept, the hours of the afternoon drifted slowly away, the sun slipping into the western sky and finally sinking in a brilliant scarlet blaze beneath the horizon. The coming of complete darkness, the Highlander awoke, fully rested but strangely disturbed. He hastened to find Shield, 
and together they walked the almost deserted corridors of the Buckhanna home, searching for Hendel and the Elven brothers. The long hallways echoed the low tapping of their boots as they hastened past statue-like sentries and darkened rooms, pausing only momentarily to observe the still death-like form of Palant's back Hannah as his positions watched over him with expressionless faces. His condition remained unchanged, his wounded body and shattered spirit struggling to survive the crushing weight of a death that was slowly, inevitably pushing down against them. When the two silent forms moved at last from his bedside, there were tears again in Shield's dark eyes. Convinced that his friends had gone to the city gates to await the return of the Prince of Callahorn, Minion saddled two horses and the couple rode toward the Tertian Way. It was a cool, cloudless night, lighted by the silver shimmer of the moon and stars, and the towers of the city stood clearly outlined against the sky as the horses swung onto the bridge of Sandic. Minion felt the welcome coolness of a friendly night breeze blowing in soothing waves over his flushed face. It was unusually quiet along the Tertian Way. The streets deserted and the houses that lined the way lighted but empty of laughter and friendly conversation. An audible hush had settled over the besieged city, a grim whispering solitude that hovered and waited for the death that came with battle. The riders rode anxiously through the airy silence, trying to find some comfort in the beauty of the starlit sky that seemed to promise a thousand tomorrows for the races. The towering heights of the outer wall loomed blackly in the distance, and on the parapets burned hundreds of torches, lighting the way home to the soldiers of Tursus. They had been gone a long time, Minion thought to himself, but perhaps they had been more successful than anyone had dared to hope. Perhaps they had held the Myrmidon against the Northland hordes. Moments later, the riders were dismounting at the mammoth gate of the giant wall. The Legion barracks were alive with activity as the restless garrison worked feverishly in preparation for the battle to come. There were knots of soldiers at every turn, and it was with considerable difficulty that Minion and Shill finally managed to reach the ramparts at the top of the broad walls, where they were greeted warmly by Yana Sempre. The youthful commander had maintained his village lookout without rest since Balinor had departed and the slim face was lined with weariness and anxiety. After a few moments, Durin and Hendel appeared out of the darkness to join them, followed somewhat later by a wandering day out. The little group stood in silence and stared into the darkness that ran northward to the Myrmidon and the Border Legion. Far away they could hear the muffled shouts and cries of men fighting, the sounds carried tauntingly by the fresh night wind to the straining ears of those who waited. Gannis remarked absently that he had sent out half a dozen scouts in an effort to discover what was happening at the river, but none had returned. An ominous sign he had decided several times to go himself, but a gruff handle had reminded him each time that he had been placed in charge of the defence of Tursus and each time he had reluctantly discarded the idea. Duran resolved in his own mind that if Balinor did not return by midnight, he was going out to search for his friend. An elf could travel undetected through almost any opposition, but for the time being, he waited like the others in growing apprehension. Shill spoke briefly of the unchanged condition of Palance back Hannah, but she received only a disinterested disinterested response and quickly gave up the impossible task of trying to take their minds off the battle at the river. The little group waited one hour, then two. The sounds grown slowly louder and more desperate and it seemed that the fighting had moved closer to the city. Then suddenly a vast formation of horsemen and foot soldiers appeared out of the darkness almost directly in front of the bluff winding in staggered columns onto the wide stone rampway leading into the city. The approach had been almost imperceptible, 
and their unexpected appearance from out of nowhere caused everyone atop the outer wall to gasp audibly. Janice and Prey sprung an alarm toward the mechanism that secured the iron fastenings to the giant gate. Fearful somehow that the enemy had managed to outflank Balinor, but Hindle quietly called him back. He recognised what was happening, even before the others suspected. Leaning out over the rim of the wall, the dwarf called down sharply in his own language and received an almost instant response. Nodding grimly to the others, Hindle pointed to the tall rider who had moved to the point of the long column. In the soft moonlight, the dust-covered face of Balinor Bared upward, the grim visage confirming what they all suspected the moment they recognised him. The Border Legion had failed to hold the Myrmidon, and the army of the Warlock Lord was moving against Tursus. It was nearly midnight when the five who remained together of the little band from Kelhaven gathered in a small, secluded dining room in the Bacana family home for a brief evening meal. The long afternoon and evening battle to hold the Myrmidon against the Northland army had been lost. Although the cost and lives to the enemy had been terrible for a while, it appeared that the veteran soldiers of the Border Legion would succeed in preventing the floundering Northlanders from gaining the southern bank of the Swift River. But there were thousands of the enemy and where hundreds failed, thousands ultimately succeeded. Acton's horsemen had swept lightning-like against the fringes of the Legion line, shattering every attempt by the enemy to outflank the entrenched foot soldiers. Advances into the heart of the Southland ranks had resulted in the death of hundreds of trolls and gnomes. It was the most dreadful slaughter Balinor had ever witnessed, and eventually the Myrmidon began to change colour with the blood of the wounded and dying. And still, they kept trying. Trying as if they were mindless creatures without feeling, without understanding, without human fear. The power of the Warlock Lord had so enslaved the collective mortal mind of the giant army that even death had no meaning. Finally, a large band of ferocious rock trolls breached the far right tip of the legion's line of defence. Although they were slain almost to a man, the diversionary tactic forced the Tersians to shorten their left flank. In the end, the Northlanders were across. By this time it was almost sunset, and Balinor quickly realised that even the finest soldiers in the world would be unable to retake and hold the southern bank once darkness set in. The Legion had suffered only mild losses during the afternoon's fighting, and so he ordered the two divisions to fall back to a small rise, several hundred yards south of the Mimitan, and reassemble in battle formation. He kept the cavalry busy on the left and right flank, making short rushes at the enemy to keep them off balance and to prevent an organised counter-thrust. Then he waited for darkness. The hordes of the Northland army began to cross and force as twilight fell and mingled astonishment and fear. The men of the Border Legion watched as hundreds they had first crossed turned to thousands, and still they kept coming. It was a frightening spectacle the bordermen beheld, an army of such incredible size that it completely covered the land to both sides of the Myrmidon as far as the eye could see but its size hampered its manoeuvrability, and the change of command and the chain of command seemed disorganized and confused. There was no concentrated effort made to dislodge the entrenched Dersen from the small rise. Instead the bulk of the army milled about on the banks of the southern shore after crossing, as if waiting for someone to tell them what to do next. Several squads of heavily armed trolls made a series of rushes at the Legion command but they were equally matched in numbers, and the veteran soldiers quickly repelled them. When darkness came at last, the enemy army suddenly began to organise into columns five deep, and Balinor knew that the finest sustained rush would, be, would break the legion to pieces. With the skill and daring that had made him the spirit behind the fabled border legion and the fighter's field commander in the Southland, 
the Prince of Galahorn began to execute a most difficult tactical manoeuvre. Without waiting for the enemy to strike, he suddenly divided his army and attacked far to the right and left of the Northland columns, striking sharply in short feints and taking full advantage of the darkness and terrain every Borderman knew well. The soldiers of the Legion drew in the flanks of the enemy to form a ragged half-circle. Each time the circle grew tighter, and each time the Tersians retreated a little farther. Balinor and Fenwick held the left flank, while Acton and Messaline commanded the right. The enraged enemy began to charge madly, stumbling awkwardly over the unfamiliar ground in the growing darkness. The retreating soldiers of the Legion were always just a few steps out of reach. Slowly Balinor drew his flanks in and narrowed his lines, pulling the searching Northlanders in with him. Then, when the foot soldiers had completely fallen back in retreat, covered by the darkness and the battle behind them, the skilled cavalry drew their lines together in a final feint and slipped from between the jaws of the closing enemy trap and was gone. Suddenly the right and left flanks of the harried Northland army met, each believing that the other was the hated enemy that had eluded it for several hours. Without hesitating, they attacked. How many trolls and gnomes were slain by their own people would never be known. But the fighting was still raging when Balinor and the two divisions of the Border Legion arrived safely at the gates of Tursus. The horses' hooves and soldiers' feet had been muffled to cover their retreat, with the exception of a squad of horsemen who had stayed too far west and been cut off and decimated. The legion had escaped intact, yet the damage done to the mammoth Northland army had not stopped its advance, and the Myrmidon, the first line of defence to the city of Tursus, had been lost. Now the vast encampment of the enemy sprawled on the grasslands below the city, the night fires burning as far as the eye could see through the moonlit darkness. At dawn, the assault on, on Tursus would begin as the combined strength of thousands of trolls and gnomes, obedient to the will of the warlock lord, hurled itself against the towering band of stone and iron that formed the outer wall. One would eventually shatter. Hendel, sitting thoughtfully across from Balinor at the small dining table, recalled again the ominous sensation he had felt earlier that day while inspecting with Yana Supre the fortifications of the great city. Unquestionably, the outer wall was a formidable barrier, but there was something wrong. He had been unable to put his finger on it exactly, but it was causing his uneasiness. But even now, in the solitude of the dining room and the warm companionship of his friends, he could not shake the nagging suspicion that something vital had been overlooked in preparation for the long siege that lay ahead. Mentally, he retraced the lines of defence protecting the sprawling city. At the edge of the bluff, the men of Tursus had erected a low bulwark to prevent the enemy from gaining a foothold on the plateau. If the Northlanders could not be contained on the grassland below the bluff, then the Border Legion would fall back into the city proper and rely on the mammoth outer wall to halt the enemy advance. The rear approach to, Sirtis, to Tursus was cut off by sheer cliffs that rose hundreds of feet into the air, directly behind the palace grounds. Balinor had assured him that the cliffs could not be scaled. They were like smooth sheets of rock, completely without normal nooks and crannies that would permit a foothold. The defences surrounding Tursus should be impenetrable, and yet Hendel remained dissatisfied. For a moment, his thoughts drifted back to his homeland, to Colhaven and to his family, whom he hadn't seen in weeks. He had never spent much time with them, his whole life expended in the ceaseless border wars in the Anar. He missed the woodlands and the green shading that came with the spring and summer months, and he suddenly wondered how he would let so much time pass without a visit home. Perhaps he would never get back. The thought swept through his mind and vanished, and he had no time for regrets. Durin and Dayal conversed soberly with Balinor. Their own thoughts centred on the Westland, 
day out, like Handel was thinking of his own home. He was frightened of the battle that lay ahead, but he accepted its fear, encouraged by the presence of the others and determined that he would do no less than they in standing firm against the army that had come to destroy them. He took quietly of Linless, a shy, warm face, a permanent fixture in his mind. He would be fighting for her safety as well as his own. Duran studied his brother, noting the sudden smile, and he knew without asking that the youth was thinking of the elven girl he was to marry. Nothing was more important to Duran than the safety of Dea. From the beginning he had made a point of staying close to his brother to protect him. Several times during the long journey to Paranoia, they had nearly lost their lives. Tomorrow would bring still greater danger and once again, Duran would be watching over his brother. Briefly he thought of Eventine and the mighty elven armies, wondering if they would reach Tursus in time. Without their great strength to supplement the border legion, the hordes of the Warlock Lord would eventually break through the city's defences. He picked up his wine glass and drank deeply, the liquid warm in his throat. Her sharp eyes surveyed the faces of the others and came to rest momentarily on the troubled face of Minion Lee. The lean Highlander had devoured his dinner ravenously, having eaten nothing for almost 24 hours, finishing long before his companions. He had contented himself with a fresh wine, glass of wine, directing continual questions to Balinor about the afternoon battle. Now in the quiet hours of early morning, with dinner completed and the wine seeping through him like slow drowsiness, it suddenly occurred to him that the key to everything that had happened since Culhaven and everything that would happen in the days remaining was Alanon. He could not bring himself to think any more of of Shay and the sword, nor even of Shirl. He could only see in the forefront of his mind the dark, forbidding figure of the mysterious druid. Alanon held the answers to every question. He alone knew the secret of the talisman, called the Sword of Shannara. He alone knew the purpose behind the strange appearance of the Shroud of Wraith in the Valley of Shell. The druid Bremen, a man over 500 years dead, he alone, in every instance, along every step of the dangerous journey to Paranor, had known what to expect and how to deal with it. Yet the man himself had remained an enigma. Now he was gone from them. And only Flip, if he was still alive, could ask him what was going to happen to them. They all depended on Alanon for survival. But what would the giant druid do? What was left to him when the sword of Shannara was lost? What was left when the young heir of Yul Shannara was missing and probably dead? Minion bit his lip in anger as the hated thought slipped quickly through his mind and was banished. Shay had to be alive. Minion cursed everything that had brought them all to the sorry end. They had allowed themselves to be backed into a corner. There was only one path still open to them. In the holocaust of tomorrow's battle, human beings would die, and few, if any, would know the reason. It was an unavoidable part of war, that men should die for unknown reasons. It had been happening for centuries, but this war was something beyond human comprehension. This war between a substellant spirit being and mortals, how could evil such as the Warlock Lord be destroyed when it could not even be understood. Only Alanon seemed fully to pre to appreciate the nature of the creature. But where was the druid when they needed him most? The candle burned low on the table before them, and the darkness of the secluded room deepened. On the wood and tapestry decorated walls, torches sputtered slowly in their iron racks, and the five voices dropped to low murmurs hushed as if night were a child in danger of being unexpectedly awakened. The city of Tursus slept now, and in the grasslands beyond, the Northland army. In the peace and solitude of the moonlit night, it seemed that all forms of life were at rest, and that war, with its promise of death and pain, was merely a vague, nearly, unforgo uh, nearly forgotten memory of years past. 
but the five who spoke in quiet tones of better days and the friendship shared could not, even for a few moments, completely stifle the lingering realisation that the horror of war was no more distant than the sunrise and as inevitable as the darkness of the Warlock Lord reaching slowly and noxiously from out of the north to snuff out their frail lives.